we're recording. Cool. So hi guys, um, this is Alan, and uh, this is our discussion of Valor. We um, last month we had a discussion of uh, Malice, the book one in the Faithful of the Fallen, um, over on Philip's channel. So this month it is going to be Valor over here on my channel, and then next month Ruin on Abby's channel. Correct. Yeah. And then uh, the following month, I guess April, will be Wrath on Patrick's channel. So today we have Alex joining us as well. Hello. So everyone can say hi. I think everyone knows who we all are at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Valor, where do we start? Where do we start with Valor? We're going to start with non-spoiler discussions. And uh, this will be spoilers for Malice. We can't really talk in depth about book two without spoiling book one. So if you haven't read book one or if um, you know, you're going to have book one spoiled for you. If you don't care, then you're fine. Uh, but we'll start out with non-spoiler reviews for this book and then not, non-spoiler thoughts. And then we'll move on to spoiler thoughts um, about that. Uh, please note Professor Philip Chase's uh, Valour. His, yeah, there's an extra you. Valour. <laughs> Falloon. Uh, so, so guys, <laughs> wanted to be like Abby. That's all. Uh, so, what did we think of Valor in a non-spoilery way? Amazing, action-packed, definitely action-packed. Yeah, tons and tons of action. Uh, yeah. Like I said, what we were talking before, I think any issue that I had with Malice was fixed with Valor. I thought the writing was better. I thought it was far less clunky, and I mean, the action is just incredible. And John yeah. Wynn knows how to write characters as well, like. He might not describe what they look like all the time, but the character work is fantastic, in my opinion. I really like how it starts like straight after um, Malice. So you're like, straight into the action, you're straight into the characters, and then you're just following them nonstop since then. But yeah. it is action all the way through. Like You, you don't really stop the action. Yeah. yeah, I'd agree with all of you guys. It's pretty, like almost relentless, but there are a few moments and they actually i think in retrospect are some of my favorite moments in the book and i don't want to talk about them specifically yet but we can talk about them later but these are the moments after the action and there are just these quick little re moments of reflection and those are the ones that actually kind of grab me uh, a little bit i think in this book so i got a little a little choked up in places maybe i'm just a little bit sentimental as i get old but <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree like alex everything you said about the characters like that's one thing i'm going to talk about more when we get to the, the spoiler section yes because like you you think that they're going to be like that they're tropey because everyone who doesn't like this book is like yeah it's really tropey i mean maybe but they don't feel stale at all mm -hmm. like no like corbin I don't like the young chosen boy trope at all, but like yeah. he has made Corbin one of the most endearing characters that yeah. I like young characters that I've read in fantasy. Like I love Corbin now. For like sure. he has the perfect mix of like youth and 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 strength and like he's not like the, oh I'm gonna tackle everything, but he's also not like <laughs> 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 like it's just a really good mix. And man. His, I also really like the fact that um, not only is it nonstop, nonstop to the point where at points I was tired. Like there are points where I'm just like, it's too, like there's like, I got to rest. Like I need, I, please let them camp and not get, not get attacked. Please, please. <laughs> and, but I also like how, how, how long periods of time pass in a paragraph. We don't uh, have to yeah. see travel yeah. or every yep. meal that they cook george rr R. martin like <laughs> robert jordan for crows like, <laughs> you know, every tiny leg of the journey it's just like yeah they traveled for two ten nights i'm like 20 days have passed glory be <laughs> and the saints be praised we're closer to our destination so i really like how uh, how he does that it's just all very fast yeah yeah. I mean, to that I, point too, what I like is when, cause you have like your main set of POV characters. So like, I mean, chapter length varies from like a paragraph yeah. to several pages, but I like when there's always like a background POV or POVs happening and it's mm. just sprinkled in throughout. And rather than have like where Stormlight will like stop and do an interlude and it's like 45 pages long. It's just like, here's a couple paragraphs of what this person is doing, like off in the distance in the background. And then it's like right back to what you're focusing on. So I think he does that beautifully. And that's kind of hard to do with so many POVs, but I think he does it really well. And that kind of, like my favorite part about it, because it's so action oriented, is that he can bounce from POV to POV in the same battle 
and do it flawlessly in my opinion yeah, and you get so like cool. all these different you know viewpoints of whether a character is like about to be killed or killing somebody it's like you get those point of views and that's always really interesting i love the way he goes between the different POVs and like how short the chapters are like some of them are really short and some of them you get a few more pages but like how quickly you move between the characters like i think i pretty much enjoy reading from all of the perspectives mm, the yeah. book, which is rare when you have multiple POVs because a lot of the time you can end up having at least one character that you don't like reading from whereas I don't really have that with this series mm -hmm. that you I'm always looking forward to any of the characters perspectives yeah and this one actually has 119 chapters so that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot of short chapters and oh, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken a lot of them uh, ended on a cliffhanger constantly mm -hmm. and that makes us so excited to get back to it and then oh man I want to get back to this one. I want yeah. to get back to this one. <laughs> to get back to this one. About the about that. When, when we did our Malice discussion, how this is such a nice blend of classical fantasy, mm -hmm. but you know, obviously there are the tropes there and yeah. there's the good versus evil kind of vibe. But this is one way in which it's very modern fantasy. And that is the short, quick chapters, the yeah. perspective changes. Yeah. So it reads really fast, even though it has that classical feel as well. It's a really nice blend in that sense. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's cool. also the writing style. It's just, he's so, it's, it's more of like a Sanderson where it's definitely that modern, very approachable mm -hmm. prose and like words and sentences. It's not this like old school high fantasy where everything is like super like rosy. It's just like, it's directly to the point. And it's as if you're watching something like, the last kingdom or vikings it's just very direct like you know exactly what's happening um so that's why the the writing seems so engaging to me yeah and um speaking of those povs like what did you guys think without spoilers of the new the newer povs because i think the the new PO, big povs mm. are was it lycos Coralin, and maquin are the, three, the three bigger ones <laughs> say McKean. how should we McKean. pronounce that one philip i think it's Maquin. I, I actually agree with Patrick. That's how yeah. I was saying it yeah. in my head. Ma or Mackin or something. Am like I that. the only one that says Mackin? How do you say it, Abby? Mackin. Yes, all right. As long <laughs> as there's one other person, I'm sticking with Mackin. <laughs> Y'all can say Mackin, that's fine. Say Mackin. Yeah, I think we're going to be, be uh, forgiving about each other's pronunciations yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Mackin is definitely the, he was one of my favorite POVs in Valor. Definitely. And that continues to ruin. I mean, that's all I'll say, but I just, I, I love his POV. Yeah. So good. And Camlin too. I, I enjoyed him. Mm -hmm. I, I still love Camlin from the first book. Like mm -hmm. Camlin is, is one of my faves as well. Definitely. And yeah. the thing is, Matt Quinn, I, I, I'm not a massive revenge story person. Mm. As you know, my feelings on Rage of Dragons aren't very positive, but for some reason, I really like Matt Quinn and the direction that his story takes and the way that John Gwynn deals with his, like, revenge plot. Mm -hmm. I mean, as much as I love Rage of Dragons, McKean is a better written character than Tao from yeah, that true. perspective. So, <laughs> I mean, that yes. is what it is. He has a lot of depth to him. Yes, he does. Yeah. Yeah. As for Lycos, I found him to be the character I love to hate. You know? oh, yeah. <laughs> that was I, I hate Lycos. I hate Lycos. Lycos, like, I liked him in the first book because he's a pirate. <laughs> I love pirate characters. And I'm actually playing Assassin's Creed Black Flag right now because I love pirates. I'm, I'm reading this book and I'm just like, I cannot, like, he is the enemy that I, the type of villain that I hate. He doesn't yeah. take anything seriously except until he explodes into rage. He's always like, yep. ah, I have an upper hand. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he's not, he's not the like the patrician type. He's not like the brilliant uh thinker. He has plans, but he's not like the intellectual planner. He's like yeah. the he's just the complete consummate rogue who's just like, uh, uh, I'm gonna take advantage of anyone and everyone. I hate you, Lycos. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. And his his stupid grappling hook is bull crap. This crap <laughs> hook is bull crap. Like, get out of here with your stupid grappling hook, Lycos. Why don't you like his grappling hook, Alan? Are you kidding? He can use his grappling hook to grab people's weapons out of their hands? That's Why not? The devs need to, the devs need to be nerfed. He needs to be nerfed by the devs. He's too powerful. They need to patch him. It's not fair. It's not fair. I hate Lycos. 
I hate I also him. Hate we him. all hate like us. He's a horrible, horrible person. I would never want to ever come across him in real life. He is just the worst. So <laughs> he definitely then John Gwynn did a great job of writing his character. Exactly. Totally, totally. totally. Uh, hate his guts. Yeah. Yeah. I also um I think the old POVs, like you were saying, uh Camlin, um, Philip, I love that Camlin is still like traveling and and finally has some loyalty. Like he's yeah. You know, at so many parts, he's thinking like, I could ditch these people. You know, he's running with the, the crowd that escaped Dunkerig at the end of uh, Malice. Mm -hmm. And so many times, like I could run, mm -hmm. but he's made friends with these people, you know? Yeah. And so I really, really like that. I liked uh, Coraline as well. Yes, I like uh, her. She's great. I like her. It, it, it does get hard when I'm trying to read quickly and Coraline and Corbin are in the exact same chapter. I'm like, why? Know. Why are, you, why are you gonna put them both with C-O-R at the beginning? Like, <laughs> it's hard to read quickly. Many or times I have Coraline saying- Just think of them by their nicknames. He's Ban and she's Cora. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what else? Uh, Philip and I, before we, were, um, before we started this, we're talking about, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna withdraw my Vikings comment here. Now that I'm, now that I'm situated <laughs> in the world, it uh, so and this came and this came about because while I was reading it, the river, the Rhenus River, is their biggest river, and that's the Latin word for the Rhine River over in Germany. Um, and so then it suddenly be became to me like Caesar's Gallic Wars, which Philip says John Gwynn has, has said to him that that's kind of you know part of what it could be based on. And so at that point, I'm like, oh okay, now it's Caesar versus the Gauls. So Caesar is unfortunately like I like Caesar, but Unfortunately, that's Tenebral, which I don't, I like less. Um, versus, versus the Gauls, who called themselves, the large portion of the Gauls called themselves in the Gallic tongue, they called them the Celts. Uh, Caesar called them the Gauls, um, but they called themselves the Celts. That's in chapter one of Caesar's Gallic War. And so I really li like, I like seeing the shield wall fighting the Gauls, essentially, who have no idea how to deal with it. None. They're like, what is this steamroller? And that's yeah, exactly yeah. what happened over in, in Caesar's Gallic Wars. He won so many battles where he was outnumbered because of the Roman, Roman discipline, Roman formation. Like the Gauls did not fight the way the Romans did and certainly did not fight the way Caesar did. And so he just mowed over a population that was so much larger than his because of the legendary Roman Roman discipline was legendary in and of itself. Roman discipline mm -hmm. to Caesar was even higher than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, for me personally, because I had when I was reading these last year, I had just started watching Vikings on Amazon, and they use shield walls all the time. Yes. So literally every single action scene when they were using a shield wall, I John Gwynn was not describing what everything looked like. I was just picturing action scenes from Vikings. And every time they yelled shield wall, I was just like, yeah, they're just dominating everybody because <laughs> it is that same thing. So like, it might not necessarily be Vikings, but that's what I pictured pretty much the whole time. So it was just like, every time the shield wall came up, I was like, well, they lost. <laughs> like They don't know what to do. It's so, it's so terrifying. It's so terrifying. Every time the shield wall is implemented. It's like, what What can they do? <laughs> they cannot do anything against this. <laughs> I keep thinking, I'm like, boulders. I'm like, get, and they even say it in the book. They're like, yeah. we need to roll boulders at them. Like, I, that's <laughs> the only thing I can think of. You need cavalry to strike at the flanks is the problem. Or like they said, you have to go in the forest or someone even like the slope, like not like terrain mm -hmm. where they can't get even footing. That's what mm -hmm. that's what defeats the the Greek phalanx, which is uh, kind of like what this is. It's, it's less like later Roman. Um, Philip you know, comments on the historicity. Without, like, the historical knowledge behind it. Yeah. Like, I just read it as a fantasy, and I could see some influences, but I don't have the, like, background knowledge of all this yeah. Celtic uh, Roman history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on that topic uh, as well, I think what we're looking at here in the Banished Lands, in some ways, there, there are nods, definitely, obviously, we talked about this when we talked about Malice. There's the, the Roman stuff with Tenebral, and, of course, uh, I, I, what really struck me last time was the kingdoms like Arden, how Brythonic Celtic it is, in other words, Welsh. And in this book, you could really see the Irish stuff. So obviously the giants talk in Irish, mm -hmm. uh, but the kingdom, and I'm going to pronounce it the way I think, I, I, I'm not uh, trained to, to speak <laughs> Irish, 
but I do believe that it would be pronounced Dolan and or something like that. Uh, in Irish, you do not pronounce the letter uh, before an H when an H occurs in the middle of a word or something like that. So it's spelled D-O-M-H-A-I-N, but it's pronounced Dolan, I think. But anyway, that particular uh, kingdom is very Irish and you can see it in all the names. And I just love the nods that John Gwynn gives to ancient Celtic mythology in here. You know, just one tiny example, you have a character in here, a giant named Baylor, right? Uh, yeah, Baylor one eye. One eye. That's, that's a character straight out of the Irish invasion myths. At least the name comes from there. Yeah, Baylor in the Irish invasion myths, this, the story of the sort of the settlement of I Ireland with the gods and, and the giants and all that. Baylor is one of the Fomorians, right? One of these um, ancient races that were there before people. And they're sort of, it's a bit like Norse mythology where you have the gods versus the giants. Mm -hmm. So you have the Fomorians who are more or less like the giants. And then you have the gods, the, the Tua de Danan. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's it's really cool. I, I think it's pretty obvious if you're into that stuff that John Gwynn knows his ancient lore really well, and I love the nods that he gives in there. Uh, so that that's one aspect of this that I really enjoy a lot. Well, in this one particularly, there's also a lot of Christian mythos in here. The stuff with like with like the 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 Ben Alim and the and the Kadashim or, or whatever, and yeah, and then, like. I, and I forget what it was, and I wish I'd have made a note of it. Like later in the book, I'm like, isn't that like straight? Like, like that just sounds straight biblical. Like this, uh, the, I forget what it was, but it's something to do. It's something to do with 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 all of that. Um, yeah, Patrick mentioned right, Patrick, last time the uh, influence from Paradise Lost. Which yeah, is based it's, it's on definitely Paradise. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, with the with the Roman thing, like I just I love that Veritas has to get pants because. It's <laughs> Because the, the Romans wouldn't have worn pants. They, they, you know, they wore the tunics and 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 their 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 the what is a belt called? Oh, how do I not remember the colliga? No, that's his boots. Um, I forget what the synctum, the synctum, the kingdom, um, the, the 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 belt that has like that looks like a skirt type thing. Um, he needs pants because it's freezing. It's like Veritas. <laughs> Everyone else is wearing pants, which was only barbarians would have worn pants back then. So I really like that as well. Um, does anybody else have any non-spoiler thoughts? Um, everyone liked this better than Malice. I think I did too, but there are times where I'm just like, you know, I like the- oh, Hello. Small... Hi. <laughs> Hello. Alex, you shrank. <laughs> she's going to join us. What did you think oh, of Valor? Oh, she's going to join us. Truth and courage. <laughs> Non-spoilery thing that I have to say is that I remember reading this and I read this back in September I believe and I was back at my parents and me and my sister had gone for a walk and I had 150 pages left and all I could think about on this walk was getting home to read the book yeah. and I was like <laughs> and like I kept thinking about like theories about what was going to happen next and I was like I just need to get home now I just need to be at home why am I on this really long walk <laughs> I mean, it was a nice walk it was a nice day but like I just wanted to be at home and reading the book yeah. Alex, we, we enjoyed your daughter's insights on Valor. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah she, she was more was knowledgeable than you. <laughs> slamming doors and screaming while <laughs> my wife tries to get our son down for a nap. Uh, All right. So, if no one has any non-spoiler thoughts for the good of the order, we're going to trans trans transition. Transition. I think she has. I think she has a non-spoiler thoughts. <laughs> Her non-spoiler thoughts are. <laughs> Whatever. She's going to be playing with my dogs, so I may be muting myself from time to time. That's fine. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about spoilers for Valor, so if you have not read Valor, you should vacate the premises um, and then come back afterwards. So bye, guys. Thank you for bye. joining us. We'll be back on Abby's channel for Ruin. So guys, I don't, really, I don't even know where, where to begin. First of, first of all, I like that John Gwynn leaves Dunkerrig with such a large party because mm -hmm. I know from the beginning that that party is gonna be whittled down. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, like that party gets whittled. Yeah. Like there's, <laughs> no one's dad is safe. If you are someone's father, you better, you better, you better run. Like, cause no one's dad is safe. Everyone's dad is dying, except for Tuchel. Tuchel survives, right? Or however. Yeah. His numbers, you know, his number is up though. You got to think. And then, <laughs> yeah, his, his numbers moms, do so well. moms don't do so well either. Did you notice that? Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> she lasted to the end. At least she got to the end. 
Yeah. Oh man, I got so sad at that part. It's like a Disney, Disney movie. I knew, I knew, I knew it was coming, but still. Yeah, I think, I think we definitely knew it was coming. So, so what I like, I love the characters in this. Like, I love that Corbin, he, he doesn't want to be the chosen one. Like, he's like, and and normally that's annoying. Yeah. But he doesn't want to for good reason. He doesn't want, like this is all he has left of his home, and they're yeah. demanding that he abandon them and go some foreign place where he takes up this mantle of like avatar of god like <laughs> i get it i'm with you corbin like screw those people and so i i love his growth and i love his quasi i, I like the romance i i hate romance in books guys but the well, romances <laughs> that are budding between veritas and and cywin and then Coraline and corbin i thought yeah. they were super sweet like don't Marvel don't sex. count out Feral yet. Did you oh, like I win? Did you just say you liked the romance in a book? In this book, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, right? I know it's a shock. Um, thoughts on thoughts on Corbin, guys. Thoughts on any of the characters, really? I love Corbin. Uh, I love I love him. I love him from the start, and yeah. it never stops. I, I always like him. I think he's such an endearing character, and I think uh, because right now there is a lot of morally great characters. It is the trend, right? And I think it's kind of refreshing to get back at cactus that's totally good sometimes. Yeah. Yes. I'm also a sucker for a pet companion. So oh, yeah, that that. Storm exists, <laughs> just like that's shooting up the scale for me. I usually don't like those, but I like Storm. And for Patrick and Abby and Philip, I liked the crows in this book. I did not like Kraft in the last book, but I like <laughs> I like the crow and the raven in this book. Like You're so I changed my opinion. I, yeah. Wow. You, you, Two you talking like, birds. You, you, you're liking the romance. You're liking the animal companion. I don't what's what's going on here? I don't know what's happening. I'm thinking you're secretly reading Sarah Jamas right now. <laughs> um, uh, I like. What else? Hold on. Any other? Oh. Do you guys have any other like, thoughts? Simon and Veridus, I really like that budding potential romance. Um, but Veridus does get really annoying in this. You, you just want to like shake some sense into him. Yeah, I like Veridus. I'm with him. Like like uh, Patrick says, like the morally gray is the trend. I do like the fact that there are much. There's much starker. Like most of the bad guys, there are some. There are some gray characters. Like right now, like we've got like Veridus is pretty gray. Like he's he's on the yeah. wrong side. Yeah. But he himself is a is a is kind of a good guy. He's a good um, guy. Well, he's and super then moral. And then Nathair, like, who I don't. Yeah, yeah, he's extremely loyal. And I don't think Nathair, Nathair isn't trying to be a bad guy. Like he's trying to- He do... thinks he's right. Yeah. Yeah. But he then you have Calidus, uh, Lycos. Lycos. Jail. Like I'm gonna find jail I and know. punch <laughs> him in the throat. Like I hate that. Like I know, I know I hate Lycos and I, I'm certain that I'm gonna hate Lycos later because there is no body. All he got shanked. Thank you for getting shanked, Lycos. But we know he's not gone. We know, like, no one here who hasn't read past it thinks that Lycos is gone. There's no body. <laughs> he just got shanked. Like, but jail or Gile or whatever. I hate <laughs> that guy. I hate him so much. Gile. <laughs> yeah. So there, there are the obviously like selfish, kind of evil characters in here like Calidus and Jael and all these, these dudes. But then you have like, uh, just to go back to Nathair and um, Veritas for a bit. Veritas, how many times does he have to tell himself greater good? It's for the greater good. Yeah. You know, he keeps repeating this to himself. To, it's almost like, you know, he's trying to convince himself. There's a part of him that knows that this is wrong. He's wrong. And, and he just keeps, oh, I gotta be loyal to Nathair. And that's reprehensible in a way too, even though he seems like a good guy, it's, it's like, come on, you're deluding yourself, dude. And so as far as the, the fair goes- like in, a, in a way, because you yeah. know that he's the villain. Like he is yeah. not fighting for, the t for, the, for good, but he yeah. thinks that he is. And yeah. so he's yeah. being like put into this role as a villain, but he doesn't, he doesn't think that he is and he doesn't want to be a villain. Right. So it's a really That's interesting dynamic when you're thinking about the good guys things. and the bad guys, when you're thinking about an affair, because he is seeing himself as good. Whereas yeah. you know that Lycos and Calidus are bad. Because, yeah. And they know that they're bad. Sometimes the worst villains are the ones who really believe that they're right. Yeah, right. That they're good. 
and they can be the most dangerous of all in a way because they're well well, because he i mean he feels like he is you know sent by a god to do this task so he's like i will literally do anything to get to that point because i'm the chosen one like right yeah yeah, he's and the fact that he, he embraces this role whereas corbin in contrast says no how can i be the chosen one it's a it's a stark difference there nathair i am the chosen one you know and so (laughs) i think that makes nathair's position makes fideles um and i just pronounce it because it's it's literally ablative in latin like it's a straight ablative word or a straight latin word um her her um chapters are going to be interesting now as well because that's her son and she definitely knows that lycos is and the 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 vent alone are like evil but she loves her son and she thinks she doesn't think her son is evil. And so I'm really curious on where that's going to go now that she's escaped. And for like freaking, we're going to talk about that in a second, that the stuff with, with her and then Lycos and uh, yeah. get out of here. But what, <laughs> what you were saying about Veritas, um, Philip, like he shows that the greater good thing, it's like, what, has anybody seen Hot Fuzz, the movie Hot Fuzz with Simon Pegg? Like the, the whole tagline of that is the greater good. And <laughs> It felt like that, um, but Veritas lets lets Maquin go, Maquin and Orgel and the 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 younger one go, and yeah. that's why I really like Veritas. Yes, it is extremely frustrating. He's on the wrong side, and he, and it's really frustrating when he's like, "Yeah, I'll kill Corbin. I'll feel bad about it because of Cywin, but I'll do it if I have to." And yep. I'm like, "No, what are you doing, Veritas? Don't do that." Yeah, that that line from Fidel situation yeah the oh, one thing i mean i really like fidel as a pov character yeah same 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 and that whole situation just i felt for her so much i was like where well, she's stuck unable to to talk or like do yeah. anything completely controlled by life who's just a sadistic horrible horrible person and you're like when that end scene where macklin is inside. fighting orgel in the pit and then everything all kicks off and like she's backstabbing, not back, she's like attacking Lycos. Yeah. Getting her back and like getting her agency back. And I'm like, yes, Fidel, yes. <laughs> I am, um, one thing I struggle with in this book was like the, the, what do they call it? The effigy magic seems too powerful. Like why is everyone not using it on everybody? Because uh, Philip, Clearly, Alcyon is be is the same thing is happening to him, right? Like definitely, he yeah. he has been forced to do this by mm-hmm. Calidus. He has some kind of control over him. I don't know if he has his hair in a in a wad of clay or whatever, but he's definitely not a willing participant in this. And you can see the poor guy; he's just he's yes. broken. You know, he's he has broken. to kill the, the he has to kill the bairns, the 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 young giants, like even at the very beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That whole yeah. that whole scene in like the cave when they did that was bad. That was so sad. And then like Castell, that was. Oh, I didn't think Castell was dead until the beginning of the book. <laughs> so you know when you finish Malice and you've got like Castell and Simon are both like a bit tricky, and I was like, all right, Simon's definitely gonna be alive. She's definitely gonna be alive. Yeah. Yeah. And she was, and I was like, okay, fine. She, I was like, Castell's definitely going to be alive. He's going to be alive. And then you're like, you're reading the book, and Matt Quinn is the first chapter, and she, he's like, he's dead. And I was like, but he's not dead. He's not really dead. <laughs> like, I was like, he's not really going to be dead. He's going to like reappear and be fine. No, he got, yeah, he's done. The, he's done. <laughs> the back of these books don't have a like, don't have a blurb, and so I looked at Goodreads just to read the blurb about Malice. They freaking uh, spoil Macquin oh. getting thrown into the slave pits. That happens 300 pages into the book. I thought yeah, it was going to happen right at the beginning. Goodreads is not safe. Their descriptions of the book will just be like, so here's a bunch of things that happened. I'm like, oh. Well, well, maybe you should get the UK edition. Do y'all have a blurb? Yeah. yeah, they have a blurb in the UK edition. All we have are quotes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no spoilers on the UK edition. That sucks. Yeah. So I was the whole time I'm like, well, I guess Macquin is eventually going to get put in the slave pits. And sure <laughs> enough. I want to go back for a second to what Abby was talking about with the deaths of characters. Yeah. And this is where I found breaks in the action. And this, these are parts that I actually, that looking back are to me the most powerful in, in here. 
And for example, when um, Heb dies, you know, uh, yeah. in that particular conflict, and it wasn't Heb's death so much as Brina's reaction to his death that really grabbed me. And you could tell they had a really uh, quirky relationship all through Malice and through the beginning of, of Valor. Valor. It was kind of like they're an old married couple, you know, and <laughs> there's something, there's a deep affection there beneath the, the constant bickering or, or whatever. And so when you have this tough old lady break down and, and, and mourn and, and cry, and you have Corbin's, um, you know, very sincere and a little bit clumsy attempts to comfort her. Yeah. That got me, that really was powerful to me. And yeah. of course the scene at the end with Corbin and, um, and uh, I'm gonna say Cohen, you guys can say Cywin, it's fine. Um, but <laughs> I win. When they're mourning their mother, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just, I, and there's something about the, the bond with a mother that's just, uh, you know, it's just a powerful thing to begin with, but. These are the moments that got me uh, more than I, you know, the rest of it flew by and mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't have a problem at all, you know, sitting down and I enjoyed reading, but these are the moments that really stuck with me, the ones, and I think Gwen handled them well, you know, these, these moments of, and you've got to do that, I think, to, to write um, a, a, a good book. You, you need to, it can't be just action, 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 action. You, oh, no, you no, no. These, these moments. Right. And I feel for Simon like so much like she's been separated from everyone for so long and then she reunites to have her mum be killed right in front of I her. Know. <laughs> and you're like, when but is this girl going to get a break? I love, I, I love the fact that like Gwyneth, I think from the beginning, like Gwyneth was prepared to sacrifice herself to make sure her kids were reunited and that they were safe. And I think, so I, I think Gwyneth died knowing that, um, you know they were in good hands and at least her kids were together like yeah. I, I think part of like part of that desire to get Simon like from the second they realize that Simon's alive first of all it's to get Corbin to safety second yep. it's to, after they realize Simon's alive to get Simon back like that's kind of the fuel that's that's pushing her on through these like horrific situations yeah like, I don't think she I don't think she would have tolerated dying before finding finding her daughter and you see it in her last words. She says, my darlings, and that's it, you know? And that, that just encapsulates everything you just said, Alan, in those two words. Yeah. And well, even when you're saying about, about Brina, like when Heb died, her reaction, she's neutralized the rest of the book. Like we see her do, we see her do and say almost nothing the entire yeah. rest of the book, like it lays her out. And so even when we're not focusing on her, like we focus on her grief at the beginning when it happens, but even just seeing her not do anything, seeing her not weigh in, seeing her not really partake in what's happening, just continues to further show us through exclusion, how she's feeling, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. I think what's good and impactful about those moments too, like where a character does die, is that you get a moment of reprieve, but then it's like, okay, we're still at war. Like we're still running. We can't just sit here and have a funeral and mourn. Like we got to go. So it's almost like harder on our main characters to have to deal with that and then just keep going. I mean, it puts them through the ringer. Yeah, it's like Pharaoh when he carries uh, his his father's body for mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he's uh, like, nope, not not leaving it behind. Poor yeah. giant kid. <laughs> Poor yeah. huge child. <laughs> And I think what Philip said, uh, what Philip's, uh, to go back to what Philip said regarding the nonstop actions are bad. And I think that's really true. And come to think of it that Valor is almost all actions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, uh, that's the purpose of Malice is to establish all the characters. Yes, it can be slow paced and some people will probably be bored by it. Uh, and like it. it didn't for me, but because I did end up caring so much about the characters. And because of that, by do, by establishing the characters first, uh, when Gwyn used all the actions in the second book and so and beyond, it worked. And uh, even the moment of respite, even though they're so, so brief in comparison, they work too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because Gwyn has established a connection with the characters. You're right yeah. in the first book, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We even, I mean, even even small things like what's uh, the first one to die is uh, Dath's dad, uh, the the drunk fisherman, um, <laughs> and I for, I forget what his name is, but even like like it's even that is interesting, even though that guy's a nobody, 
because Daff is sad, mm. but his dad beat him. And he, like, he asks, he asks Corbin or he's like, why did he hit me if he loved me? And it's just like, oh, like, like that hit me. Like, just, I don't know, like too hard for him being a throwaway character. Poor Daff loved his dad. So Daff is experienced both, experiencing both relief where he's not, gonna, he's not gonna get beat up by his dad anymore, but also like, you know, profound loss because this is dad. He loves his dad. He doesn't understand why his dad punches him when he gets drunk. And isn't it just because his mom died? Like, I forget why the yeah. fisherman was drunk, but- The mother had died and that's why he, the father turned to drink. Don't you guys love how Gwyn made Camlin the father figure for Dath after? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. I just got, I guess I got chills. That's so good. Like, I, I love Camlin's loyalty to these people and him uh, giving Dath a purpose after his dad dies. Yeah. Like, I love the found family aspect between all yeah. of them because a lot of them have all lost someone and, like, the relationship yeah. that they all build with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the moment when uh, Gar um, and Tuchel reunite after like years apart yeah. like the father and son coming together after years and years and years and you're like <laughs> and Corbin says he sees Gar smile for the first time <laughs> yeah. of Gar how about the budding romance that obviously gets squashed yeah. when when um, uh, Gwyneth dies and yeah. you see Gar suddenly really emotional yeah. and he's got tears and wow, that was another powerful aspect of that too, because here's this guy who's been denying himself, denying himself, and you can tell he was in love yeah. with this woman and of course could never act on it all this time. And for him to lose that, uh, really gut-wrenching, yeah. yeah. Oh, such good stuff, like talking about this, such good stuff. <laughs> do, There's do a lot of emotions. Freaking Lycos, like, mm. like, okay. So I have not ran past, uh, past this book, here is my prediction. Lycos is like, y'all cover your mouths, don't tell me anything. Lycos is the big bad. That's my prediction. Lycos is the big bad because Lycos is, Lycos has no loyalty to anybody. I hate these characters. He has no loyalty to anyone. His loyalty ain't to, ain't to uh, Azroth. No, his loyalty is not to Calidus. His loyalty is definitely not to Nether. His loyalty is to Lycos. And screw you and your stupid grappling hook, Lycos. Like, <laughs> I know he's gonna come, like he's waiting to betray everybody in a book of betrayals. There are so many betrayals in this book. Just call it betrayal. <laughs> like everyone betrays everyone in this freaking book, everybody. Like when freaking Maeve shanks Aramon, yeah. what? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what I said. My the first line of my Goodreads review was like, "This should have been called the Backstabbers and the Betrayers, or something like that." Seriously, was just like, everybody was just like, "Nope, nope, no." <laughs> what do you think about the relationship between Hallie and and Connell and how that all developed? That's so good. Like, <clears throat> and then Coraline, Coraline also having to come to grips with like that. I love that. Is is Hallie on alive? Did he make it to the boat at the end? Or he did didn't he... make it to the boat, but he's alive. He, he is he's alive. captured by his brother, by Connell. Yeah. Merrick died though, defending the boat, yep. correct? Yeah. Yeah. That was tragic too. Freaking yep. like, how does Gwyn do this? Like <laughs> right? him and getting his hand cut off. And I like that it shows the bitterness that you would have. Like you can't, like he's a hunter. He can't use a bow. And he's and mm -hmm. he's he's ticked off at whose fault it is that he lost it. Well. It's the guy who like it's it's the dog's fault. It's not their <laughs> fault, you know. Right. But him struggling with that bitterness, Merrick was good too. Yeah, I liked him. I wanted to see his arc continue, but I guess his role is to basically we're going to see how Idana reacts to that loss, which is obviously tragic. About Lycos, though, Alan, I haven't read past Valor either, so this is just prediction on my part. I see him more as like a loose cannon. You know, he's kind of like you said, he's in it for himself. Um, and he's going to do whatever he thinks is to his advantage at the moment. And he's not a, like a, a plotter, you know, deep thinker, like you said, but I, I see him as not, I think Nathair still has a role to play here. After all, he is the, uh, what's his real title here? He's not the bright star. He's the dark, um, black sun, dark star. Black star. Yeah, he's black the black sun or whatever. Yeah. Black, black sun and the bright star. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got, Nathair's got to do something other than sit on the uh, steps and, and like 
whoa, what just that happened was here? So good. Right. It was so yeah. good when he's just like, are we the baddies? Is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are, bro. <laughs> okay, so Phil, yeah, here's my good. prediction. I think that Nathair still blacks up. I think Lycos betrays him. I think Lycos shanks Nathair. I'm calling it here. Lycos shanks Nathair. That is my. That's what I'm calling. I don't know if that's gonna be if that's gonna be true. I think like, I don't trust him, Philip. Like, I think you're right. Like, I think he's the loose cannon, and I think he's gonna. Be, I think he's gonna betray Nathair in the end. Okay, I think it's good that you made the prediction. We we, we shall see, and yeah. I can see Abby's there, kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> they can't tell us anything. All we know is that like us is the worst. He's, he's a horrible am. person, and like. Horrible, horrible. I, <laughs> I yeah. do like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Philip. No, I really. I was. I was reacting to, and it's something that Abby said earlier too. That really, the whole uh, Fidele, um, Lycos line storyline in here i found to be extremely disturbing oh and correct just, and i love the way you you put it though abby that moment when she gets her agency back is is powerful because of it so yeah. I, I think that that's a really cool thing you said yeah yeah and um like and like we like like we said philip alcyon is definitely under the same spell because he, he even mentions hair earlier in the in the uh in the book yeah and so I'm glad that Alcyon doesn't get his agency back at the same time. Like, I think if, if both of them had got it, it would have um, decreased the effectiveness of either one. Yeah. Um, because I kept thinking that in the end, I kept thinking at the end, Alcyon was going to, like, he was going to help them at the end too. And he didn't. He gets, like, bowled over by by uh, one of the, yeah. by, by who? Baylor. Yeah, 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 by Baylor. What it, speaking of the effigy stuff, I like that we learned more about the magic system of what little there is here. We got to see Corbin training in the earth magic. We got to see the weird effigy stuff, which like, that's so powerful. Like I'd be walking to everybody I know, yanking hairs, like, let me get <laughs> 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 an, army, an army of people who obey me. <laughs> what is wrong with Ellen? Why is it picking <laughs> <laughs> there is a magic system, but it is very much like on the back burner. Like yeah. it's there, but it's not like the front and center of the story. It's just mm -hmm. like put in in little bits every now and again. You get a hint of magic about what's going on with that. And I like that. I like that too. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, even indirectly, where it's, it's not necessarily like people casting spells, like you have magical creatures, like you have these dregs and these worms and giants and i mean even wolven are sort of like i mean they're abnormal at, at the very least and then you've got you know the whole thing with the katoshim at the end where you know in that scene when the is looking around and like you're just seeing these like bodies rise up he's just like what <laughs> it's like what? yeah there's there's a some magic going on guy you're you're in over your head so I the mean, cauldron is a portal like in a way that allows the katoshim katoshim to return Take mm -hmm. flesh in our world. Yeah. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. Like they're, they are scary. Those cut off their heads off. Yeah. I would never I want think. to meet a Kadoshim. Could Charlie <laughs> say it? Seriously. Like just at the end where Kalidus is just completely taking over and Nathair has Nathair, like it becomes very clear, like Nathair. You are nothing. Like you are nothing here. Like you Come are on. you. You might as well have craftsmen written across your forehead because you are purely a tool. You are nothing to anybody. Because <laughs> Kaladish just takes control, and they're like, "Cut it!" Kaladish is like, slit his throat, and Nathair even says, "Wait, what?" Like Nathair's <laughs> like, "What are you? What? No, don't!" And Kaladish is like, "Yeah, I don't care." <laughs> Cuts his throat, <laughs> and Nathair is just like, "I just love that him." realizing how out of his depth he is. And I cannot wait to see how that's explored in Ruin mm -hmm. because there's no way Nathair can go back to thinking that he's the boss somehow. Like that he just can't, he's not the boss. He's not in charge. As he's, supposed to, he's supposed to be the avatar of the big baddie, right? So I mean, I, something has to happen where Nathair Maybe he gets possessed in a way. Yeah. Again, I haven't read, so I don't know. Maybe he gets yeah. possessed in the same way that the um, the uh, others got possessed by the Kadashim there in that scene. I don't know, but he's got to. I feel like he's got to do something yeah. bigger than 
then just look stunned when he figures out, oh, wait, we're the bad guys? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, you only stunned for a certain amount of time. You can't like live permanently in a state of shock. Yeah. Right. Speaking of the, the Azeroth stuff, like, am I the only one that thinks since Evnis made the deal with Azeroth that like his part of the bargain sucks. Like Evnis did not get jack crap from this like deal with Azeroth. I mean, I guess he's nominally in charge of Arden now, maybe. But it just seems like Evnis got the short end of the stick with this bargain. He's having to murder all these like people he's theoretically loyal to and finally maybe gets the castle, but he's not, he's subject to Rin. And right. well, who's, by the way, Rin seems to be doing very well. I can't, can't help but think there's got to be some kind of showdown here between Rin and the Thayer where Rin clearly sees herself as, you know, she's grabbing, <laughs> grabbing, grabbing as much as possible. And she's not the avatar, right? So there's, there's, I mean, there's gotta be some kind of falling out here, I think, but who yeah. knows? Yeah. Yeah. He for Evnis as well, cause like he has got the bad end of the deal. Cause I mean, he's lost his wife. He's lost yeah. his son. Yeah. What does he have left now? Apart from like ruling Arden? Lost book. He's lost his book. He's, yeah, well, he's nothing. He's stupid. <laughs> <Ever so bad>. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. It's what happens when you get yourself to the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. yeah, yeah. With Rin, like you said, Phil, Rin's going to be interesting to do. Again, yeah. I don't like. To me, here's here again. To me, Nathair is going to. They're going to shuffle him along like like a child king. Like when when a child comes into into power on the throne, like a ten year old, and there's all these regents vying for power that say, "Okay, go ahead, stand there, wave. You're the king. Yeah, yeah, right. You're the king, right? That's what it feels like to me. It feels like Nathair's going to get shuffled from one place to another by Rin, Lycos, and Calidus, and because it just seems like Nathair doesn't have. I don't know. He doesn't. I, I don't know. You're. I think he's going to have to be possessed if he's going to actually like become the mantle for evil. Because otherwise, I don't think Nathair has it in him to be like. I don't think he wants to kill babies and you right. know this. So I don't know. And Rin, I thought Rin knew that Corbin was the like. I thought Rin knew way more than she did. So when she found out, like when they were doing the dream sequence, like that was really cool. Mm. Yeah, she's a bit like Lycos in that when she gets Corbin, it's more like, what can I do with him that will be an advantage to me? It's not like, oh, I better hand him over because he's yeah, yeah. wanted, you know? So she's definitely in it for herself too. Yeah, like, like Abby said, I feel bad for Nathair because no one on his side is on his side except for Veritas, but Veritas isn't with him. Yeah, he's Everyone alone right, is, now, right? He's How alone can they right. use him? What, Patrick, sorry? He's alone, right, at the end of this book, only with Calidus, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I do like the way that John Green, like, deals with villains as a, and, like, good and evil yeah. as a theme, and, like, the way that is explored throughout the book. Because you don't, there are, like, there are people that are on the good side, and you're like, well, are they good? And you've got very morally grey characters, and you're like, you just... It's very hard to see who is good and who is evil because you can look at Veritas and go, right, well, he's fighting for the bad side, but he's not bad. Mm. He's not an evil character. He's not like a malicious person. He's just stuck in a horrible situation. So is that what villains are? Are they people that have been stuck in horrible situations and they gradually turn into being evil people? Or like, what, what makes someone a bad, evil person? Yeah. I don't even think that Connell is evil. I think Connell has just been overshadowed by his brother for so long that he, this is the only way that he can like make his, his mark on things. Um, and yeah, he, I mean, he's a bad guy, obviously, but like, <laughs> I don't think he, like, I don't think he wants to be known as the evil guy. I think he wants to be known as better than Hallian. And the, he can't, he can't be better than Hallian on the same side as Hallian. He has to be the one that beats because he doesn't, he hesitates multiple times when he could have done like the pure evil thing. Um, who is it that Coraline stops him from like murdering like right at oh, the- that's Corbin, yeah. Oh, there you go, yeah. So yeah, I, I see Connell as making very bad decisions, evil decisions. And 
you also have to put it, uh, take into account what happened to his mother and Halion's mother. Um, and that's a, a reason for his bitterness. Yeah. Not that it's an excuse. I, I think what he does is pretty awful, actually. And, yeah, yeah. and, and basically, uh, um, well, I don't, we, we don't say bad words on Alan's channel. So, um, but <laughs> he's not a nice guy. <laughs> I'm sure he's Alan bad. has a phrase for it. He's a yeah. douchebag. There, that, <laughs> that's what I meant. Yeah. That's right. He's the one that cuts Merrick's throat at the end. That's right. No, screw yeah. I take back everything I said. Screw you, Connell. <laughs> you, have to, you have to grade all these villains on a curve, right? There's like the pure evil that are literally serving like Validus. Satan. And yeah. then there's people like Nathair who are like a willful or like willing idiot to go along with it and do terrible things because they're so convinced and like brainwashed yeah, right. that they are the person that's supposed to be doing these things and saving people. So it's like, he doesn't want to kill innocent people, but he's so like brainwashed into thinking that he has to. Yeah. And there's all these people pulling his strings around him that he does. So it's, it's not excusing him. He's kind of like weak in that sense that he's willing to do this, but he also is so convinced that he's right. He's right. So it's, yeah. yeah. And then like the people like Connell, who his circumstances have led him into being a bad, evil person. Mm -hmm. That he's not born evil. That it's just been what life has given him. And that's the path that he has chosen for himself. Yeah, and there's no like him. mustache twirling evil villains in it. That's really. Calanus and like how, Well, yeah. <laughs> you can see how people's circumstances have like led them into being villains. Yeah, and I like the contrast there with Halion, who like at the end it would have been more beneficial for all of them to drop that kid and run. Like more of them would have survived if they hadn't tried to save the kid. If they'd just let him cart let him cart the kid off. But Halion made an oath. Halion swore an oath and he's keeping his oath despite the fact that his oath here is to that like wretched woman who it says murdered their mom. Like she orchestrated the murder of their mother. And so that contrast right there at the end with Halion and Connell where Connell can't forgive that but Halion made an oath. And so more people die saving this, you know, this 10 year old or whatever, this young kid because he, you know, because he didn't just let Connell take him. Such a good book. John Quinn's <laughs> the man. Like, so good. Like, talking, like, I think books are good, and then I talk about them with people, and then I'm like, this book is so good. Like, talking about it, it's just, <laughs> ah, it's all these good to so good. Yeah, it's so good. So it goes from good to so good. Like, ugh. Um, that That's woman. That's what book is all about, right? That's what I know, right? Yeah. Like, how, like, I hated that woman, Araman's wife. Like, yeah. She's the Archie? worst. What was her name? Have I made that up? Yeah, I'm not. I don't think I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's uh, Royson or R O I S I N. Royson. Royson. Yeah, that's what I would say. It might be an S a sh sound. I don't know, but anyway, she's not I mean, nice. I've got some friends from Ireland, and they pronounce it Roisin. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Did Did Uthus get his comeuppance? Did he get shanked at the end? Uh, did he wait? And he killed um, Namain, didn't? Yeah, but that's before the final battle in the. Yeah, uh, and then I don't, I don't think he died. I think he's still. He does it's still safe in this book? I think. I thought he got oh. shanked. <laughs> well, I know the two birds got him. They they started pecking his eyes and stuff. Yeah, betrayer. I love crap and feck and like. I did too. <laughs> Good is so good at writing animal companions. Yeah. He's so good at it. Try to remember if Uther Scott nailed other than the birds um i don't remember now but i don't think it must be not and <laughs> it's, it's, it's very confusing i mean the ending was just a lot of chaos and a lot of just you know obviously midst of battle and there's a huge uh, emotional moments there and the unveiling of we haven't talked about uh michael yet oh um, yeah yeah i mean the i expect him to have a bigger role in the next book but you know, I guess we'll see, but he, I, I, up till now, hasn't shown nearly as much power as I think he has. And Definitely if, not. Yeah. Why? Why is it that the bad angel type characters or bad characters get to show all their powers, and but the good ones, like you know, Gandalf or whatever, they don't, they don't show their <laughs> full power? And so I think Michael's kind of a, a character it's like because that. they're good. Because yeah. if they were just power hungry monsters and wanted to like show off, they would be the bad guy. Yeah. And I guess they have to let the mere mortals 
discover their own strength mm -hmm. as well as that that must be part of it too um but yeah I'm, I'm curious to find out also how the whole avatar thing works so corbin is supposedly the avatar of elian and what does that mean exactly uh, you know is he going to be uh, in some way um possessed that's a bad word so is he, is he going to be imbued with mm -hmm. elian's presence or something like that how, how does this work that, that's something I'm curious it's very interesting and it's yeah. interesting to see how it develops through each of the books because a lot of the prophecy has already happened mm -hmm. uh yeah. in Malice but it's interesting to see how it is a continues throughout the rest of the books mm -hmm. without saying too much yeah because we sit we learn in this one like the the that Veritas is what true heart and like Calidus is Blackheart or whatever. Hold on, where's the thing? Yeah, True Heart and Blackheart. Yeah. Um, and so that, like, and I'm ready to see Michael's like cool stuff also. But I mean, you know, the good guys are, like Alex said, like they're they're the ones who don't or reluctant to use their power. Right. There, there will be more of them in the next book. Nice. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's I just what I looked, want to hear. It doesn't look like Uthis dies. I, um. Balor, is that his name? Baylor? Yeah. Baylor? He's, Baylor? he's charging for Uthis, but then they see that Alcyon has the axe, and so he diverts and gets the axe from Alcyon instead. Right. So this I'm is excited so for you guys to read Ruin. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> we, I mean, we learned in this that Lycos is Petrus, uh, Petrick's favorite character. What? Um, <laughs> How dare you? That's what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't y'all oh, get that? I think we learned some very important things during this that Alan can like romance in a book. Yeah. And that's call the most like animal companions, which is a whole new thing. The only one I'm going to start liking <laughs> hobbits now. Yeah, that's, that's probably it. Well, though, to be fair, I have seen those movies. I read those books when I was in middle school, and I've only seen the movies one time. So I said to my wife, I'm like, we need to watch the movies again. And so maybe my opinion will change. Wow. We'll see. The hobbits? Well, yeah, about hobbits. I don't like hobbits, Patrick. They're the worst. Yeah, I think, I think you will hate them more if you watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. So, Philip, I'm eager to see what what how our predictions bear out. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I'm so I'm so excited and, to keep reading. And, and I appreciate the rest of you not laughing at our predictions. So, yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I think it's really fun to hear about this. <laughs> so, who are your favorite characters by the second book? That's a good. That's a good question. I mean, it's Cywin. I like. I like. Sorry, I, like I just. I've, I've liked her all the way through. I liked her from book one. I. I, I like Cywin. Ah, uh, yeah, she's great. Yeah. But for me, I maybe it's um, however you're gonna say it, uh, Mackin or Mackin. Okay. I don't care how you say it, but I think he might be my favorite uh, storyline. I found myself, for whatever reasons. Uh, more like looking forward to his his yeah. uh, storyline. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe I don't. I like. It's hard to say. I, there's a lot of, to like about a lot of these characters. So yeah, mm. maybe because he's older, I like him. Uh, yeah. who knows? That's that's where I was too. What about you, Patrick? <laughs> In book two, who's your favorite? If you can I, separate from the rest. Makin. I was immediately hooked by Makin's chapters. I just love his storyline so much. Very cool. Yeah, Alex. It was mostly the same. I mean, I loved McKean all throughout book two. Uh, and then Corbin, Coraline, and Kywin were my other three main that I love. Um, unpopular opinion. Like, I like Veritas. Like, I don't I don't know why. Like, I really like Veritas. Maybe because he's, he's a good character. Veritas is the Roman. Um, that's probably why. Um, but I, li I like Veritas. Like, I really like that. I'm so eager to see where he goes because him and Cywin are very obviously on the opposite side. And is he going to be able to kill the girl that he's like in love with? You know. Also, I find I'm glad I finally got to see how old Cywin is. She's 18. She's slightly older than I thought she was. Um, like I thought she was like 16, and Corbin was 14, and that may have been true in the first book, like when everything started. Um, it was right. I think it was in the first book. Oh, okay, then I I just like I, I it was nebulous how old Cywin was in this, but she's I mean she's like an, she's an she's an adult. She's a young adult. Um, so I really like Veritas, and I also like Maquin, obviously. Like his storyline was just kind of, it was so set apart from the rest of everything else that was going on. Um, I really liked like just seeing how awful the Venthaloon are, like, and how yeah. terrible freaking Lycos is. And like, I'm gonna put a graphic <laughs> over your eyeball, Lycos. I like how Maquin develops in the next books as well. So I hope 
you will all continue to like him as a character because I yeah. I really like him as a character. I just like how I like how he is struggling with what he's having to do. Like he is going to kill Jael or Jail. Like that like and if John Gwynn has any justice, I get to look forward to when this happens. John Gwynn, John Gwynn, if Jail dies not by Macquin's hand, like at some or if he survived, John Gwynn, that cannot happen. <laughs> I need you to understand me. I need you to, if that, back in time and rewrite him, if, if so, that is the justice that I must need to see done. Like Wait, that- I would is- actually rather see Fidele kill Lycos. That's I'm what okay I, that, that would give me even more satisfaction um, in a way, but so, yeah. Lycos is, Lycos is, is, he's just pure evil. Jail is this just twerp. Like, <laughs> twerp. Oh, he's just such a twerp. Oh, I hate him so much. You know, and he's he's the kind that's terrified whenever, when like, oh, I'm about to die. Please don't kill me. And then he's like, hey, hey, I won. <laughs> Dude, you yeah, that's true. Pants two seconds ago. Two seconds ago, you wet your drawers. It shows how well written these characters are if they evoke such strong emotions. Yeah. There. Yeah. Lycos is never afraid. He just gets mad. You see, like every time, like something doesn't go his way, like he just gets enraged. Mm. So, anyway, guys, thanks for this discussion. This was super fun. Like, oh, yeah. good <laughs> they are good. Yeah, thanks everybody. I had a, uh, this was a ton of fun. It makes it so much more fun to read these too. As, as much as I had fun reading the book. I love talking to you guys. So thank you. Yeah, I totally understand. And the next, uh, the next video will be. Uh, hosted by Abby. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yep. It will be ruin. There channel. is a lot to discuss in ruin. <laughs> I hear I have to have my my handkerchief ready for ruin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hear that. There I will be that. moments that will yeah. hurt. So. It might it might ruin you. <laughs> yeah, it is. The title is is very very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. John Gwynn does not always uh, give you justice that you. No! ask. No. John Gwynn! <laughs> no specific. There will not always be justice where you expect yeah, it or want it. Okay. So. I am okay with injustice. If Jael does not get murdered by <laughs> Macklin, I am going to be so upset. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write sternly worded letters to John Gwynn addressed saying, re Jael. And I'm just going to say every day until he, he, he retcons it. So anyway, um, guys, thank you for thank you for uh, you know joining this discussion as always, yeah, and uh, we will be back next month on Abby's channel to talk about ruin. Ruin. Yeah. Bye bye. How do I stop recording? <laughs>